My name is Tom, welcome back to my channel and to another episode of Politics, my series in which we take a look at Netflix, politics and the point at which the two meet. Today we'll be taking a look at the recently released episode of Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, in order to consider how the interactive, choose your own adventure inspired form which that film takes might encourage us to reconsider the manner in which we engage with and interpret films, art, and by extension, the world. For while considering themes surrounding technological innovation has always been the raison d'etre of Black Mirror, in Bandersnatch and adopting the interactive movie form, Black Mirror has essentially brought about a technological innovation in and of itself. And today I'm interested in what the consequences of that innovation might be upon the meanings that we derive from filmic texts and the process through which we do so. To begin, let's take a brief look at the history of interactive movies, because the concept of an interactive movie is not exactly new. Czech film director Radu Sincera, not entirely sure how he pronounced that one, is widely credited as pioneering the form with his 1967 installation Kino Automat, which roughly translates as Movie Vending Machine, which was part of the Czechoslovakian exhibit at the 1967 World Fair. Each seat within the Kino Automat featured two buttons, and at regular intervals throughout the showing of the film One Man and His House, actors from the film would step out in front of the scene and invite the audience to vote on what response they wanted the protagonist to have to a certain dilemma. Depending on the audience's decision, the narrative would then progress in one of two different ways, and at the time this was considered very notable, particularly in a period where having some kind of agency over which direction a narrative might go was either incredibly rare or perhaps unheard of. Despite the positive reception of Kino Automat, however, the interactive movie form has never really caught on as a mainstream form of either filmmaking or film consumption. And up to around the late 1990s, we might suggest that this was simply due to a lack of the required technologies needed for audience feedback. While the American cinema chain Lowe's Theatres did adopt voting technology prior to the release of 1992's less well-received I'm Your Man, most cinemas simply did not have this functionality. And even if they did, the lifespan of such a movie would have been limited. It would have been almost impossible to broadcast an interactive movie on broadcast television, and any kind of home distribution would likely have involved lots of either scanning backwards and forwards on VHS tapes or swapping tapes in and out, making for quite a clunky experience. Yet it is interesting to observe that since the late 1990s and the widespread adoption of the DVD and concurrent current developments with home computing, there has indeed been the technology there. And yet, interactive movies have never really been seen as more than a very occasional gimmick. Instead, the legacy of Kino Automat, and in the intervening period, the legacy of the Choose Your Own Adventure books, from which Bandersnatch very overtly draws its inspiration, has largely been carried forward by video games. Titles such as Life is Strange and The Walking Dead, as well as having the immediate interactivity inherent in the video game form, also allow the decisions that the player makes to massively influence the world in which that game is set and the way in which the narrative develops. However, I would also suggest that audience expectations perhaps also plays a key role here. For the fact that we have come to expect interactivity as a matter of course when playing video games means that interactive storytelling, where there is definitely a key story to be told, yet in which the audience is given agency over how that plot develops, has been able to gain traction within video games where it hasn't so much within live action film storytelling. 
as such, games such as The Walking Dead or Life is Strange have largely been perceived as legitimate art, whereas a live action interactive version of the same story may have seemed packneyed or gimmicky. Unsurprisingly, some reviewers have equally labelled Bandersnatch as a gimmick, perhaps simply given an overhaul for the streaming age. Yet, for the most part, whether praising or criticising the narrative and themes itself, I think critics have largely engaged with Bandersnatch in much the same way that they might engage with any other filmic text. Interactivity here has not proven a barrier to Bandersnatch being perceived as a legitimate work of art with artistic integrity. Just to emphasise, artistic integrity doesn't actually really mean anything, it's just a value judgement that we impose upon cultural text in order to ignore those ones which we don't particularly like. I think that there are a few reasons that Bandersnatch has been received in such a way. Firstly, I think the existence of games such as The Walking Dead has in fact created a space in which a film like Bandersnatch might exist. It has gently warmed us to the idea. Furthermore, the anthology format of Black Mirror perhaps opens itself up to experiments such as this in a way that a interactive episode of Narcos or Orange is the New Black, say, may have been a little more jarring. Ultimately, however, I think Bandersnatch manages to employ the interactive movie format in a way that we are inclined to take seriously, largely due to the fact that it actually engages with the issues of interactivity within the text itself. The narrative and themes are very much interested in what the ramifications of audience interactivity and agency might be for both the characters involved in the text and for the audience ourselves. In order to consider this further, we first need to arm ourselves with just a tiny little bit of theory. So let's choose to pick up the book, shall we? In order to guide the rest of our discussion of Bandersnatch's employment of the interactive movie form then, I'm mostly today going to be drawing on ideas from the French philosopher Jacques Ranciere's 2009 book The Emancipated Spectator. Within that book, Ranciere explores the power dynamic at play within a theatre auditorium, and the relationship between a play taking place on stage and the audience sat in their seats observing it. Despite Ranciere's focus on theatre, however, I think we can usefully expand his argument to include our discussion of, of theatre, film, television, and ultimately today, Bandersnatch. So, Ranciere argues that when we sit in a theatre, or in a cinema, or indeed in front of a television screen, that we have become accustomed to considering our role there as a passive one. We, the spectators, simply sit back and absorb the images that are presented in front of us by the actors and other creators involved in creating that text. He suggests that, as a consequence of this, we often consider our relationship with a text to be similar to that between a student and a teacher, in which there is a gap of knowledge between the two, and it is the role of the teacher to guide the student from ignorance to knowledge. In a similar way, he suggests that our rendering of ourselves as passive when consuming a narrative acted out texts tends to lead us to consider there to be inherent meaning within the text itself, with our role simply to be guided by that play, film or television show towards the knowledge that it possesses. And Ranciere is adamant that such a power dynamic is inherently problematic. It devalues the role of the spectator in the creation of meaning, while also discouraging us from finding alternate meanings within a filmic text. Some of you will be aware of Roland Barthes' essay in which he declares the death of the author. Within it, he very much argues that the spectator or reader of a text plays a very, very active role in the creation of whatever meaning that text has. In short, he argues that while a film director or TV showrunner may lay out all the clues within that text's, the meaning of that text is never really complete until we, the spectator of that text, have pieced them all together. 
And the different ways in which we piece all those clues together will undoubtedly affect the meaning which we take away from that text. Beneath Rancière's argument is a very, very similar idea. Yet he expands this notion to suggest that the form through which we watch theatre, film or television encourages us to forget the active role that we play. As we sit there, passive, in front of a stage or screen full of activity, our physical passiveness encourages us to think of ourselves as intellectually passive too. The crux of Rancière's argument then is that it is not simply enough to encourage film viewers to go away and read the death of the author or to encourage them to more critically engage with theatre, film or television, but that in order to truly emancipate or free the spectator from that power dynamic, we must fundamentally alter the manner in which a filmic text is delivered to a spectator. It's worth saying at this point that I don't advocate leaving behind traditional film storytelling completely. However, what I am interested in is exploring what Rancière's ideas might reveal to us about how Bandersnatch works. At the heart of what I want to say about Bandersnatch today is that the interactive movie form presents a potential intervention in that power dynamic that we're used to when consuming a filmic text in making us sit up, grab our TV remotes, and make active decisions in which direction the narrative progresses, Bandersnatch also encourages us to be critical in how we create meaning from that text as well. Now it's worth highlighting that the airing of an episode of Black Mirror has always engendered a considerable amount of discussion, particularly since the show moved from the British Channel Channel 4 to Netflix and amassed a more global following. One mainstay of these discussions has always been the inclusion of Easter eggs within each episode. Although each episode is ostensibly self-contained, the show's creators have often hidden in little elements which potentially link some of the episodes to one another. Some of these are fairly benign, such as the regular appearance of the news service UKN whenever someone switches on the TV, or the repeated use of the song Anyone Who Knows What Love Is Will Understand. Elsewhere, they seem to imply a certain causality between episodes. In Bandersnatch, for instance, the game studio Tuckersoft shares its name with the game studio from Series 3's Playtest. Equally, in Hated in the Nation, one of the police officers states that they transferred to the Cyber Forensics team, having previously been involved in the Rannock case, a reference to the child murders committed by Ian Rannock, the partner of Victoria Skillane, the protagonist of Series 2's White Bear. Others still are even more abstract, the numerous reappearances of the White Bear logo, for example. However, I would argue that the inclusion of Easter eggs does not entirely subvert the power dynamic to which Rancière refers. Although we might be more involved in having to actively seek out elements of the text, the power dynamic is still that the meaning is there within that text, it's just a little bit harder for us to hunt down. The interactive form of Bandersnatch, however, ensured that post-viewing discussions of this episode had a somewhat different nature to them. In particular, it's been interesting to observe people discuss what the real or true ending of the film is. And of course, depending on who you ask, you will get a different answer. While Forbes' Danny D. Placido put the ending in which the game gets five stars but Stefan ends up in jail, and the ending in which the camera pulls back to reveal a film set among his top three, others seem mostly split between choosing to join Stefan's mum on her fateful train journey, or the other meta ending in which Colin's daughter, Pearl, is finishing editing this very episode of Black Mirror. Now it is true that there are a number of analyses on YouTube and on other platforms in which the person reviewing the show proposes to be able to tell us what the objective definitive ending of the film is. And in a different yet similar mode, 
there is a series of articles and videos which propose to explain exactly what each of the endings mean. And to engage or analyse Bandersnatch in this way is very clearly to place it within that framework of there being meaning inherent in the text itself, with it being our role to find out what that objective meaning is, and by extension that one person can find out the meaning of that text and tell other people what it is. However, I think to take such an approach is to somewhat miss the point of Bandersnatch. Far more interesting to my mind are those conversations in which viewers have revelled in and celebrated the fact that others will have found different endings to have given them a more complete sense of closure for themselves. Such conversations take it as read that different individuals watching the same text will find different meanings resonating within them from Bandersnatch. Because which ending one chooses as definitive within their own headcanon will likely be influenced by a number of elements within the text itself. It might be influenced, for example, by which ending you saw first, or indeed which you saw last. And it might also be influenced by the order in which you saw each of the scenes and each of the narrative threads during your first watch through. What makes matters even more interesting here is the fact that Bandersnatch does not only give us the choice between different linear narrative paths, it actively encourages us to loop back and try different options. In doing so, it creates something of a fragmentary experience. As Nicole Casso has argued, fragmented narratives such as this interrupt homogenising tendencies, which aim to suggest that a text has a definitive, objective meaning in order to provoke a sense of awareness and reflection. In this way, the more we loop, the more we find ourselves drawing connections between different scenes that we've seen during different narrative paths that we've taken. There is, of course, some logic given to this within the text itself. Colin explains that within the fictional world, when you reset back to a former choice, the new path you take is still affected by your previous choices. For example, if you choose to work at Tuckersoft and reach the somewhat abrupt ending in which the game is rushed out and critically panned, when you return to the office for a second time, Stefan will have retained knowledge about Colin's game, Nosedive, and Colin will have gone from never having heard of the book Bandersnatch to being a big fan. Yet this looping mechanism does not only alter the content of the narrative of the scenes that we see, it also, as Casso describes, affects the meanings that we derive from them. To return to discussing endings, for example, I certainly found myself connecting with Pearl's metatextual ending far more having already previously seen the alternative meta-ending in which Stefan is revealed to be an actor on a film set. Had I not seen that other ending before I saw that one, those issues of metatextuality might not have been in my mind and I might have had a very different response to it. The manner in which Bandersnatch ends up being a kind of collage of different scenes means that we become very aware of our role in drawing connections between one scene that's been presented to us 10 minutes ago and one which we're currently watching now, of drawing comparisons between two different versions of the same scene or connections between them. Ultimately, however, I think that the meanings that one derives from Bandersnatch will largely be influenced by the real-world experiences that the viewer brings to the text themselves. If one has ever suffered through a creative experience that has drawn them to near madness, for example, the echoes of Stefan's consternation in Pearl's meta-ending might resonate to a great level. Whereas if one has experienced loss and considered the manners in which they might have stopped themselves from experiencing that loss, then that ending might resonate instead. In this way, Bandersnatch is like any other film, because the real world experiences that we bring to a text will always influence the themes that we consider to be strongest within that text, as well as our moral response to it. Black Mirror has always embraced viewer subjectivity in taking on morally ambiguous themes in which whether a character committed the right or wrong action is 
unclear and very dependent on one's own opinion. Yet in a shewing linear plot, Black Mirror brings the spectator's role in the creation of meaning very much to the fore. In many ways, I think the fragmentary viewing experience that Bandersnatch provides is perhaps more important in encouraging us to think about the film critically than the fact that we get a say in what order we see those scenes in. In many ways, I think a randomly generated version of Bandersnatch in which the computer decided what order we saw each scene in would have had equal effects in encouraging us to do this joining up of different scenes. However, to return to Rancière's argument, I think the reproduction of film's usual power dynamic in which we sit passively simply wouldn't have reminded us of our interpretive agency in quite the same way. In short, by giving us agency in choosing the manner in which the narrative develops, Bandersnatch not only reminds us of that narrative agency, it also reminds us of the agency we have in thinking about filmic texts critically. In experimenting with the interactive movie form then, Bandersnatch presents a potential intervention in the usual power dynamic through which we consume filmic texts. In doing so, it reminds us that we have the ability to think critically about films that we watch and that our doing so has real value. Doing so has ramifications for how we view Bandersnatch, but also, hopefully, might have ramifications for how we interpret other filmic, literary or televisual texts and, by extension, the world. Bandersnatch's interactive movie form encourages us not to be passive spectators, but active ones who seek out alternate meanings, seek out our own meanings in texts which we might usually assume to be closed. Thank you very, very much for watching this video if you've made it this far. Um, it's been fascinating to make this video and there's lots of conversation to be had around Bandersnatch. It'd be great to have some of that down in the comments below. Of course, if you've enjoyed and would like to see more of this, then please do consider subscribing. For now, however, thank you very much for watching once again and have a great week.